more. We close the week with some Thurber, three Thurber notes. My thanks to the folks at Thurber House for letting me speak at Monday's presentation in New York of the Thurber Prize for American Humor. It was a delight, too brief a one. My congratulations to winner Steve Healy, the author of How I Became a Famous Novelist, and my birthday wishes a day late to Mr. Thurber's daughter, my friend Rosemary. Thurber and dogs are inexorably intertwined. Last week I began his tale of Muggs, the Airedale, who was forever sinking his teeth into everybody, and his mother, who was forever making excuses for Muggs. We'll finish this right out of the Library of America, Thurber Writings and Drawings, with part two of The Dog That Bit People by James Thurber. One time, my mother went to the Chittenden Hotel to call on a woman mental healer who was lecturing in Columbus on the subject of harmonious vibrations. She wanted to find out if it was possible to get harmonious vibrations into a dog. He's a large, tan-colored Airedale, mother explained. The woman said that she had never treated a dog, but she advised my mother to hold the thought that he did not bite and would not bite. Mother was holding the thought the very next morning when Muggs got the Iceman but she blamed that slip up on the Iceman. If you didn't think he would bite you, he wouldn't, Mother told him. He stomped out of the house in a terrible jangle of vibrations. One morning when Bugs, Muggs bit me slightly, more or less in passing, I reached down and grabbed his short, stumpy tail and hoisted him into the air. It was a foolhardy thing to do, and the last time I saw my mother, about six months ago, she said she didn't know what possessed me. I don't either, except that I was pretty mad. As long as I held the dog off the floor by his tail, he couldn't get at me. But he twisted and jerked so, snarling all the time, that I realized I couldn't hold him that way very long. I'd carried him to the kitchen and flung him onto the floor and shut the door on him just as he crashed against it. But I forgot about the back stairs. Muggs went up the back stairs and down the front stairs and had me cornered in the living room. I managed to get up onto the mantelpiece above the fireplace, but it gave way and came down with a tremendous crash, throwing a large marble clock, several vases, and myself heavily to the floor. Muggs was so alarmed by the racket that when I picked myself up, he had disappeared. We couldn't find him anywhere, although we whistled and shouted until old Mrs. Detweiler called after dinner that night. Muggs had bitten her once in the leg, and she came into the living room only after we assured her that Muggs had gone, run away. She had just seated herself when, with a great growling and scratching of claws, Muggs emerged from under the Davenport where he had been quietly hiding all the time and bit her again. Mother examined the bite and put arnica on it and told Mrs. Detweiler that it was only a bruise. He just bumped you, she said. But Mrs. Detweiler left the house in a nasty state of mind. Lots of people reported our Airedale to the police, but my father held a municipal office at the time and was on friendly terms with the police. Even so, the cops had been out a couple of times, once when Muggs bit Mrs. Rufus Sturdivant, and again when he bit Lieutenant Governor Malloy. But Mother told them it hadn't been Muggs's fault, but the fault of the people who were bitten. When he starts for them, they scream, she explained, and that excites him. The cop suggested that it might be a good idea to tie the dog up, but Mother said that it mortified him to be tied up and that he wouldn't eat when he was tied up. Muggs at his meals was an unusual sight because of the fact that if you reached toward the floor, he would bite you. We usually put his food plate on top of an old kitchen table with a bench alongside the table. Muggs would stand on the bench and eat. I remember that my mother's uncle Horatio, who boasted that he was the third man up Missionary Ridge, was splutteringly indignant when he found out that we fed the dog on a table because we were afraid to put his plate on the floor. He said he wasn't afraid of any dog that ever lived and that he would put the dog's plate on the floor if we would give it to him. Roy said that if uncle Horatio had fed mugs on the ground just before the battle, he would have been the first man up Missionary Ridge. Uncle Horatio was furious. Bring him in! Bring him in now, he shouted. I'll feed the mm, on the floor. Roy was all for giving him a chance, but my father wouldn't hear of it. He said that Muggs had already been fed. I'll feed him again, bawled Uncle Horatio. We had quite a time quieting him. In his last year, Muggs used to spend practically all of his time outdoors. He didn't like to stay in the house for some reason or other. Perhaps it held too many unpleasant memories for him. Anyway, it was hard to get him to come in, and as a result, the garbage man, the ice man, and the laundry man wouldn't come near the house. We had to haul the garbage down to the corner, take the laundry out and bring it back, and meet the ice man a block from home. 
After this had gone on for some time, we hit on an ingenious arrangement for getting the dog in the house so that we could lock him up while the gas meter was red and so on. Muggs was afraid of only one thing, an electrical storm. Thunder and lightning frightened him out of his senses. I think he thought a storm had broken the day the mantelpiece fell. He would rush into the house and hide under a bed or in a clothes closet. So, we fixed up a thunder machine out of a long, narrow piece of sheet iron with a wooden handle on one end. Mother would shake this vigorously when she wanted to get mugs under the house. It made an excellent imitation of thunder, but I suppose it was the most roundabout system for running a household that was ever devised. It took a lot out of Mother. A few months before Muggs died, he got to seeing things. He would rise slowly from the floor, growling low, and stalk stiff-legged and menacing toward nothing at all. Sometimes the thing would be just a little to the right or the left of a visitor. Once a fuller brush salesman got hysterics, Muggs came wandering into the room like Hamlet following his father's ghost. His eyes were fixed on a spot just to the left of the fuller brush man, who stood it until Muggs was about three slow, creeping paces from him. Then he shouted. Muggs wavered on past him into the hallway, grumbling to himself, but the fuller man went on shouting. I think Mother had to throw a pan of cold water on him before he stopped. That was the way she used to stop us boys when we got into a fight. Muggs died quite suddenly one night. Mother wanted to bury him in the family lot under a marble stone with some such inscription as, Flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. But we persuaded her it was against the law. In the end, we just put up a smooth board above his grave along a lonely road. On the board I wrote with an indelible pencil, Cave Canem. Mother was quite pleased with the simple, classic dignity of the old Latin epitaph. The dog that bit people by James Thurber. Beware of dog indeed. That's October 8th, the 2,717th day since President Bush declared mission accomplished in Iraq, the 2,306th day since he declared victory in Afghanistan, and the 172nd day of the Deepwater Horizon disaster in the Gulf. I'm Keith Olbermann. Good night and good luck. And now to discuss why the Democrats are missing an opportunity to run on their issue. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Rachel Maddow. Good evening, Rachel. Good evening, Keith. Thank you for that. Have a great weekend. You too. And thanks to you at home for staying with us for the next hour.